Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. Zola Levitt presents Considering the times and seasons of our world today, here's Zola Levitt. Shalom. Hello again. You know, on our past trip to Israel, we had a rather an exciting adventure. We received an offer that we could go with our American crewmen only, not the Israelis, to the checkpoint at Ramallah and meet a friendly Palestinian TV crew, and they were friendly and professional. Uh, and they would take us into Ramallah where we could observe firsthand what was going on in the West Bank, uh, Arafat's headquarters, and especially we could interview uh, Hanan Ashrawi, who is a major spokesman for the PLO, uh, Palestinian Authority. She was a uh, member of their national parliament and so forth. A very outspoken uh, critic of Israel and uh, one of the important voices in this uh, ongoing controversy. Uh, we took him up on it. We uh, crossed through the uh, checkpoint. Uh, it was rather tense and pressuresome, and we uh, met with uh, Mrs. Ashrawi. And um, she talked to me, with, and, and it's just her point of view, obviously. And uh, in some ways, I, I found myself disagreeing with her characterizing things, and I knew that that would probably be the case. But I didn't want to comment personally. I didn't want to be Zola versus uh, Dr. Ashrawi. So we have friends over here who are Arab Christians. She's an Arab Christian. And so we, uh, we took the tape of our interview uh, to two men, very trustworthy in uh, Arab uh, Christian affairs and also on the situation in the Holy Land. And that is Dr. Ergen Kainer, who is a professor at Criswell College. He's been on our program before. And Joseph Farah, a journalist. He is the uh, editor of the World Net Daily uh, computer page, uh, one of the largest uh, news uh, pages on the computer. Very important. And uh, he also is an Arab Christian. And what we did was take the points she made and give them to Dr. Kainer and to Joseph Farah and let them comment. And we'll let you be the judge. So we started this way. Uh, Dr. Ashrawi, I really appreciate you taking time to talk with us this morning. Uh, My pleasure. Call me Hanan, please. Hanan, I will. I, mean, I know you're, you're very busy. I, I noticed in the paper the other day that uh, while uh, uh, Mr. Arafat made changes in the Palestinian cabinet, you didn't approve entirely of the changes. No, I actually... Uh politely declined uh, my appointment to the cabinet oh, did, yeah. one more time because I felt that this wasn't the real change that we needed. We don't want change for change's sake. We want a qualitative shift. I guess there's a certain amount of, as most governments, uh, uh, corruption and, and problems, and uh, you have always been a voice uh, against that sort of thing. Yes, I'm certainly for integrity in government, a system of governance that is human-based and essentially democratic, and of course, the exercising the principle of accountability and building efficient and professional and transparent institutions, respecting the rule of law. I could recite the whole thing, but I know we can do it, and I know we have the means, the, the human capacity to do it. The problem is we need the will to carry out this change and to break with the legacies that have brought about such tremendous suffering. And I feel the Palestinian people deserve it and deserve better. With regard to Hannah Nishrawi's comments about integrity, um, we have to give credit where credit is due. Hannah Nishrawi is one of the few people in the Arab world who has criticized Arafat and the PLO for corruption. And of course, there's plenty of corruption to go around. Uh, much of the money that has been, uh, been funneled into the Palestine, Palestinian Authority from Western Europe, from the United States, from the Arab countries has found itself in the coffers of uh, people like Yasser Arafat in their Swiss bank accounts. Uh, some estimate that sum is in the billions of dollars. And uh, Ashrawi has uh, been critical of that uh, fact, and that's, that's good. But I think she's soft peddling it a little bit. You, you can't have it both ways. You cannot build a, a, a Palestinian free state on a foundation of corruption. And that is what we have uh, in 
uh, Yasser Arafat's Palestinian Authority. Not only does the money come from foreign governments, uh, the money also comes from a long history of narco-terrorism. Uh, the Palestinian Authority is deeply involved in drug trafficking internationally. They're involved in counterfeiting. They're involved in the kind of corruption that we here in the United States associate with, you know, gangland mob style violence. They shake down their own citizens uh, throughout the West Bank and Gaza. And uh, I'd like to see Hannah Nishrawi go a little bit further in her criticism of that corruption. Uh, yes, yes, sir, Arafat is an associate of yours, of course. Uh, it appears he's a little bit frail at this time. Is his health in good order? Or? Oh, his health is fine. I mean, uh, given his age, he suddenly, he does take care of himself. He eats healthy, he rests enough, but he's under tremendous pressure. Yes. I mean, he's between a rock and a hard place, literally, and he's fighting once again for his own survival, uh, as well as national survival. So he's uh, in a very difficult and precarious situation. Yeah. Do you think he'll be reelected in this coming election? Oh, yeah. You see, uh, President Arafat has something that very few Palestinians have. He has a sort of symbolic, national, historical dimension. And so people are willing to forgive him, to forgive him his trespasses more than they are willing to forgive oh, yes. anybody yes. else's trespasses. So they, they look at the cabinet, they look at the people around him, they blame them, they hold them accountable. But somehow they keep exempting uh, Arafat oh, yes. from this type of, of intrusive accountability. And I hear they, he speaks uh, Arabic with an Egyptian accent. He is originally Egyptian, and some object and some talk, but... Uh... Yeah. No, he's not originally Egyptian. He, he's Palestinian, definitely, but uh, he spent part of his childhood in Egypt, and he's growing up years, and he went to college in Egypt, so he has, the, oh. he has that Egyptian accent, yes. But it's something very superficial. I mean, you don't judge people by their accents. No. Hannah Nishrawi talks about the symbolic nature of Yasser Arafat, and there certainly is a lot of symbolism involved. I would suggest, however, that it is based more on myth than reality. Uh, she talks about the fact that uh, Yasser Arafat went to college in Egypt, and she soft pedals the idea that he's not a Palestinian. Well, the fact of the matter is, he's not a Palestinian. <laughs> and this, this fact that he was supported by Egypt, that he came from Egypt, that he was born in Egypt, is very important to understand the, the dynamic uh, of the Palestinian-Israeli crisis because you have to be able to define who is a Palestinian to understand the nature of this struggle. If Yasser Arafat is a Palestinian, then any Arab who travels from any other country and visits or settles in that region can be considered a Palestinian. When you consider the fact that the Arab population uh, is about a hundred to one to Jewish population in the Middle East, uh, the, you, you're not uh, playing on an even playing field by any stretch of the imagination. And so that is a, a fundamental problem that Israel is dealing with all the time. There are more Arabs living in that region today than ever before. Yet constantly what we hear is that conditions are so horrendous in the West Bank and the oppression uh, even for Arabs in, within Israel is so bad. The question is, if it's so bad, if conditions are that bad, why do the Arabs continue to migrate from every other Arab country in the world and even other Muslim countries? You know, you, you will meet people who define themselves as Palestinians today in that region who come from Chechnya, who come from Bosnia, who come from Kosovo, who come from Iran. Not even Arab population, uh, not even Arab people, and they're considering themselves Palestinian. Uh, that is a real problem uh, that we have, and, and I think that it's, it's one that is being soft-pedaled by Hannah Nishrawi. The uh, situation with Iraq has some Americans wondering if he, this time, is, is sympathetic with Saddam, or wh where does the government here stand? Uh, well, I think the Palestinian people as a whole are sympathetic uh, to the Iraqi people. That is a sort of affiliation of and, and, and empathy uh, with suffering. Yeah. The Iraqi people are suffering uh, in, a, in a multiple ways. They're suffering because they have such a system as the Saddam regime, uh. and they're paying the price of the decisions of the Saddam regime. And uh, of course, you will find sympathy among the Palestinians, the Arab world, I think all people of conscience. They don't want to see innocent people suffer. 
But at the same time, I don't think you will find anybody who supports Saddam per se, no. As, as a government, as a system of government, as, as a ruler, he, there's not much love lost. And I think the sort of emotional mistakes of the past have, are no longer uh, in effect now. Hannah Nishrawi says that uh, the Palestinian people identify with the Iraqi people because of the suffering that the Iraqi people have uh, undergone. Well, there's much more to it than that. One of the reasons that Yasser Arafat and so many of his entourage are, are supportive of Saddam Hussein, and by the way, we're supportive of Saddam Hussein in Iraq throughout the Persian Gulf War, are supportive of them now uh, as the United States is on the pre precipice of another war with Iraq. Uh, the reason they are so supportive is because Saddam Hussein has been a consistent supporter of the PLO and PLO terrorism throughout his uh, reign of terror in Iraq. I've been listening to Zola for five or six years, and when my mother called and said, uh, I'm planning a trip to Israel, would you like to go? And I didn't hesitate, I said, absolutely. She says, do you know anywhere or how to get there? I says, absolutely, let me give Zola a call. This is the most special place in the world, and uh, this was the place we wanted to be. We can't imagine that we're here. I mean, it's, you know, we just can't imagine we're here. Well, we uh, still continue our tours to Jerusalem on our normal schedule, and uh, they are going on without event. Uh, again, I've proved many times it's uh, more more dangerous to stay home than to go to Israel, despite uh, what the news, the way they color in what's going on over there. But there will come a day, you know, it'll be perfectly peaceful in Jerusalem when we all live there in the kingdom to come. I refer you to Isaiah 11 and 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Uh, very encouraging. But on our last tour, we had this adventure where we went to Ramallah. Now, that's uh, just near Jerusalem, almost a suburb, and uh, drove in with a Palestinian crew to interview Hanan Ashrawi, a Palestinian Authority spokesperson, and then we took that tape to our friends, uh, Dr. Ergen Kainer and Joseph Farah, Arab uh, American, well, Arab Christians. Dr. Kainer is uh, not American Lebanese to start with, and uh, Farah was raised in America. But uh, they commented on what she said. So picking that up again, uh, here is Dr. Ashrawi. The advertisement that ran recently with a number of signatories, including yourself, about the uh, suicide bombings. You said they're counterproductive. Uh, still, there is here and there an incident. What's your position on this? Well, I believe that targeting innocent civilians, regardless of nationality, race, color, ethnic origin, creed, uh, religious affiliation, is something that is unacceptable, morally reprehensible, and should be stopped immediately. And I believe that regardless of the motives, the justifications, uh, the, the uh, um, feelings of, of the perpetrators, that there is no way in which that should be accepted. So uh, I think we, we have to deal with this issue seriously, publicly. We have to launch a debate, a dialogue on the issue, and we cannot justify the targeting of Israeli civilians by saying our civilians have been systematically targeted by Israel, because what you condemn when it is done unto you, you do not approve, you do not adopt as a means of retaliation and revenge. Well, thankfully, we're finding some Palestinians who are against uh, the jihadin, against these acts of public suicide bombing. Uh, the sad thing is, almost all of the recent polls indicate that the majority, if not the uh, significant number of Muslims, believe that suicide bombings are not only necessary, but actually morally uh, sound acts in defense of what they believe to be the truth. Peace process, such as it is, <laughs> it's uh, ups and downs, but uh, what changes would you make it, just where we are now, uh, to make it, make it go, bring peace? Well, I wish I were in control of all the factors. Unfortunately, I don't have the ability to reappoint an Israeli government that would be okay. committed to peace. I believe the greatest obstacle to peace 
is the nature of the Israeli government, the ongoing settlement activities, the extremism, the sort of built-in racism of the occupier, the mentality of the occupier, unbridled power, resorting to violence, thinking that military might can subdue a nation under occupation. So that is one essential ingredient. We have to appeal to the Israeli public to understand that the extremism and violence of this government is bringing disaster down on both our heads, on our side and on the Israeli side. But at the same time, we need to build, to put our own house in order, to build our own uh, institutional democracy, and at the same time, to uh, have third party participation. I believe this is a global endeavor. It is not bilateral. And in this asymmetry of power, you do need international uh, participation, positive intervention yeah. to prevent further deterioration and to launch a peace process that would have substance and credibility and applicability on the ground. Well, as usual, Hannah Nishrawi blames the Israelis for being the, the obstacle to peace in the Middle East. And of course, that is terribly, terribly unfair. Uh, any impartial observer will look at uh, uh, the concessions that uh, were made, particularly through the Barack administration, uh, and recognize that, uh, that clearly Yasser Arafat and the uh, Palestinian Authority were not willing to negotiate in good faith at all that their real objectives are the destruction of the state of Israel and that no interim grounds would ever be acceptable to them. Uh, only for Western audiences does this idea that the Palestinians want to create their own separate state uh, side by side with Israel li living in peace, only uh, in Western audiences is that message even uh, disseminated. You know, it goes back to a, a strategy that was developed back in 1970, interestingly enough, when a high-level PLO delegation went to Hanoi, went to North Vietnam. And uh, they asked the, uh, the Vietnamese um, why the Western world looked at the Vietnamese struggle as a national liberation movement and looked at the Palestinian movement as a terrorist movement. And the North Vietnamese gave them some very candid advice about how to deal with that. One of the objectives was this this idea of, of creating interim steps to their ultimate objective, which has always been the destruction of Israel. And the Vietnamese gave them the advice to, uh, to come up with a, a plan for uh, their own state as an interim step that would define them then as a national liberation movement. And that's what they have done. It's been a propaganda ploy uh, for the last 32 years, uh, developed with the, the, the North Vietnamese communists back in 1970. What is the real history of the Palestinian people in this land? Well, we go back centuries. Actually, if you want, we go back to the Canaanites. So the Canaanites? Yes. Okay. The, so the Palestinians are the longest standing, ongoing, historical, human tradition in Palestine. Of course, we are also a mix of so many tribes uh, that came into Palestine. But those of us, I mean, I, my family has been here for centuries. More. Most people trace their families, you know, centuries and thousands of years. And it's, it's amazing for people to tell us you're an accident of history or this land that's your land where we define our being, our culture, our history, our sense of value from being the people of the land. And then we are told, no, well, this land has to be given away in accordance with the Bible or something. If you reorganize the world in accordance with the Bible, you'll be in serious trouble. There are three fundamental points that I think are necessary to make here historically. Number one is the ludicrous statement about a Palestinian nation. There has never in the history of civilization been a Palestinian nation, ever. The, the hue and cry for a Palestinian state did not even begin until 1948 when Israel became a nation itself. One of the things that I make a statement when I do public debates is I say, I believe the Palestinians should have as much land as they have ever had historically which of course is none. Uh, she believes that she is a Christian, and as a professed Christian, she should understand that God made a covenant with Israel. This is fundamentally important. The land was given by God to the Jews. And as a Palestinian Christian, she must know her Old Testament on this. Uh, the final thing I want to ask is, why, in the midst of all of this, cry for peace, why has not one Arab nation offered a parcel of their land to give to the Palestinians. 
And of course the answer is, this is not as much about giving the Palestinians a nation as much as it is for taking away a nation from Israel. Hannah Nishrawi, I believe, is somebody who believes principally in freedom and democracy and those kinds of things, and I give her high marks for sincerity. But when she talks about uh, the Palestinian people retracing their history to the Canaanites, she loses me. <laughs> when she talks about the fact that Palestinians uh, have the longest standing tradition in hu of humanity in that region of the world, uh, again, she loses me. All we need to do, we don't need to go back thousands of years to see who's been living in that part of the world. We can, we can go back to the, the turn of the 20th century and look at what the population levels were. At that time when the, the, uh, when, uh, the area we call Palestine was ruled by the Islamic uh, Ottoman Empire, uh, the majority of the population in Jerusalem, the overwhelming population in Jerusalem was Jewish. Uh, the second highest population level was among Christian Arabs and uh, Muslims who now tell us that uh, Jerusalem is the third holiest site in all of Islam actually were a very small minority of about 10 percent of the population. So it's very hard for me to, to uh, look at uh, what uh, uh, Hannah Nishrawi says about this long-standing tradition in the region. The truth of the matter is the Arab population has been on the increase ever since the uh, turn of the 20th century and they came for two principal reasons. They came because of the economic activity stirred by the, the Jewish immigration into the region and they came, interestingly enough, because of the freedom that Jews brought with them. Uh, among our audience, there are a number of Bible readers since you bring up the Bible. Uh, what is the history of the Jews in the land? Because they would hold that uh, the Jews have been here since the Canaanites as well. Oh, the Jews came and went in many ways, and they were part of the pluralism and the diversity of this culture. Of course, there were many Jews who stayed, there were, but it hasn't been a Jewish state, so to speak. It's been an Arab state for centuries. And we as Christians, and I'm very proud of my culture of and course, heritage, yes. we go back to the earliest Christian tradition, and so I'm amazed when I hear people, you know, in, in the West or in the Bible Belt telling me what I should be or imposing on me their interpretations of Christianity, which after all is a Middle Eastern religion. And oh, we, right. we uh, practice it, we exercise uh, yes. it, we live it yes. as a living culture. And it is part of our identity. It is my history. It is my culture. Yes. It's part of my authenticity. And the same way as the land, is my history and my culture. After all, we belong to a dual tradition, the, tradition, the peasant culture and tradition which makes the land sacred. Yeah. And of course, the birth of the three monotheistic religions. And so that gives it additional uh, value and spirituality. So both merge in my culture. Oh, yes. And I feel that I'm a very privileged heir of these cultures, of this pluralism and tolerance and, and diversity. The problem comes when you transform a religion into a national cause and identity and you try to claim exclusiv exclusivity and you expel the rightful people of the land in order to reclaim and you bring in people from all over the world thinking that this is your birthright when we have land deeds, we have history, we have ongoing reality that tells you this is ours. So it's not a question of greed, it's a question of continuity, it's a question of a long-standing ancient culture and we are proud of our heritage we are a proud nation after all and we will not be dislodged or dispossessed that's why the tragedy of 48 meant so much to the palestinians because when you dispossess disperse and exile a nation that has lived with the land on the land with the sense of family and community as being the main source of security you and we are not we certainly are a stationary people who are our, our, our uh, if, if you want our, not myth, but I would say our um, metaphor is very organic. Yes. Uh -huh. And so we are deep-rooted. So when you uproot a nation, you uh, rob it of all its sense of security, of, of its identity, of its community. This is the worst tragedy that can befall a nation. Oh, yes. This is what happened to the Palestinians. Well, obviously, for people to be dislodged and dispossessed, they must have at one time been lodged and have possessed the land. 
But again, they didn't claim land or statehood before 1948. It is only now after. And what you have is the Arab world has one common enemy, one common goal, and that is the complete annihilation and dispossession of Israel. Not everything in Ramallah was uh, a peaceful conversation. We uh, crossed a very tense border with a lot of uh, with soldiers. With I mean, it's like two countries at war almost when you come to a place like that. And uh, we looked at Arafat's headquarters or what's left of them, and boy, the news has not done justice to uh, what's happened there. Uh, we got our own footage on that. And... Uh, well, we're going to continue next week with uh, the rest of the interview with Mrs. Ashrawi and the commentary by Dr. Kaner and by Joseph Farah. Uh, I should give Mrs. Ashrawi her due. She also holds a doctorate. She taught at University of Virginia. Um, this was a, a uh, an interview where I received information I didn't know, and uh, I, like I say at the beginning, some of it I obviously don't agree with, but I thought I will step aside and not be the commentator. I usually am the commentator, but there are more expert people, and, and more so they are her peers. Dr. Kaner and Joseph Farah are exactly equal to her in that they are Arabs, Christians, knowledgeable on the Middle East, and so on. And it's not a matter of opinion when... Um, it comes to the history or the facts. There's some opinion uh, in, in, in any interview, but uh, we had them look at uh, all of what she said and comment accordingly. So you be the judge. Uh, we uh, did not censor anything that she said. We've only edited for uh, time considerations, uh, not for content. And uh, you're getting her full testimony and then the replies by our experts. So join us again next week. Uh, we'll continue this. And as you do so, <laughs> more than ever, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our offer on this program, Israel's Right to the Land. The brief biblical study that comprises this small book is one of the most compelling commentaries on current events that Zola has ever offered. Scripturally authoritative, Israel's Right to the Land. Our other timely offer on this program, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Middle East Conflict. This 474-page book truly unravels the history, theology, and archaeology of the Middle East. Easy to read and understand. The Middle East Conflict. Our free Levitt letter brings you updates on recent events, in-depth articles, Hebrew lessons, and special offers. Please call 1-800-WONDERS. That's 1-800-966-3377 or write to Zola, Box 12268, Dallas, Texas 75225. When you're on the internet, visit Zola's website, www.levitt.com. Zola Levitt Presents depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.